what is Holy Saturday like? And there are many Reverend Fathers here who could tell you this much better than I can, but I noted a few points. Holy Saturday strikes me as a time of great silence. After all the noise and tumult of Palm Sunday and the week leading up to the passion and death of our Lord, Lord and the passion and death itself, which is obviously a very noisy affair, ending with a great cry. There's the silence, and that silence lasts until the resurrection. The church today, and this is one of the greatest mysteries of the period we live in, is effectively silent. The living magisterium, which is in many senses the main reason that the church is a visible institution that's been planted on earth to live forever, appears to be silent. It's an extraordinary mystery. And I wager if you suggested it to a dogmatic theologian in 1945 or 1845, uh, he'd suggest that it couldn't be possible. Holy Saturday was also a time of obviously terrible sorrow for those who loved our Lord. And it's a time of terrible sorrow that we live in on one level at least, in that if you love the church, then the current state of the church is all but intolerable. There's also a paralysis. If you look at Holy Saturday, our Lord in his public life has started something. He sent out the 72 disciples to all corners He's gone from city to city doing good, working miracles, preaching the truth, bringing the good news. He started something. And it all stops. It's completely paralysed. He's the heart and centre of the whole thing. Of course. Nothing can be done. We're in the same position. We're in, I think what's referred to as as a holding pattern by some traditional clergy. I think it's a a reasonable reasonable term. We're in a holding pattern. We're just keeping on, keeping on, developing. How can we do that? There's a very real sense on Holy Saturday, as far as I understand, the only person who really kept the faith fully, was Our Lady. All the apostles had run away. St John, it's true, came back. But if he kept the faith, it was only because he trusted Our Lady. Faith was almost completely absent on Holy Saturday, and that's what we're witnesses of as well. And who would have thought it? Who would have thought it when this place was not just built but when it was extended that it could be emptied so fast? In human terms, it was the most unlikely thing. Even in human terms, it was the most unlikely thing you could imagine that an institution so large and with such momentum could be not just brought to a halt but just reduced in size and stripped of all the external signs of success in such a short period, absolutely amazing, like an anti-miracle. But the most significant factor probably, and the one that we perhaps need to think about, is that on Holy Saturday, everybody had been scandalised what's called the scandal of the cross. And the two disciples on the way to Emmaus, you've got to love them. Their faith was obviously 
a little too human. They had hoped that it would be him that would redeem Israel. And they're depressed. And they're leaving. I don't know why they were going to Emmaus. I don't know what was there, but it was away from Jerusalem. And it was away from our Lord. And along the way, he comes to them. And because they haven't really got faith, they don't recognize him. And so despite the fact that they're moving away from him and they're not seeking him and that they're scandalized in him, he comes to them. And then he unfolds to them the prophecies concerning himself and why the cross? Why the cross? There's a whole week's meditations. Why the cross? A whole lifetime's meditations. We know why the cross. It's easy for us. They didn't understand. They were scandalized. And then he makes to leave them and they ask him to stay. Their hearts were burning within them. And he breaks bread and they recognize him. When? In the Holy Eucharist. And their faith revives and they know why their hearts were burning within them because they'd been filled with charity by our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the resurrection had already happened. The resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, the great victory, had already happened. Isn't that fascinating? All of what I've just described is happening despite the fact that the suffering's over. The scandal's over. And our Lord is with them. This reminds me of another fact of a similar nature. Consider the nativity of Our Lady. So the fall occurs, the Redeemer is promised, the woman who will bring the Redeemer into the world is prophesied. And then all these, well, thousands of years, roll past and Abraham is called and the Israelites go through their whole history and the, the temple is destroyed, the Temple of Solomon, and the new temple is built and, and then uh, it's stated that this temple will see the Messiah, even though it's not as glorious as, as Solomon's temple. And the 72 weeks, is it 72, are up. Uh, it's time for the Messiah. And somewhere, I don't, know, I don't know where Our Lady was born. Our Lady is born. And there are no angels putting on a public display of uh, choral singing. There are no kings travelling. There's no star. There's not even a Herod trying to kill her. There's no outward sign whatsoever to the world that one of the brightest days in the history of the world and the brightest day in the history of the world to date has happened. I wonder sometimes if, while we're all sort of arguing about details, the brightest day has already happened and we just haven't seen it yet. It's an interesting thought. So what is the Catholic Church and how do we make sure that the scandal of the cross in relation to the church doesn't overwhelm us? And I repeat what I said before, the answer is acts of faith. 
But faith does seek understanding. That is what theology is, is faith seeking understanding. And we can get some insights, and these insights can assist to overcome some of the obstacles that we might encounter. The Catholic Church must be defined before we can start to discuss her. So to define the Catholic Church, she is that body of men who are baptised, who profess the true faith outwardly, are subject to the Roman pontiff, and have not been expelled from the church for some grave crime. And that's the definition that Pope Pius XII gives in Mystici Corpus Christi. So the church is all of those who are baptised, fine, and who profess the true faith outwardly. Let's discuss that. What does that mean? And why is it necessary? And to see that, we have to remember that the two great powers of the soul are the intellect and the will, that we know and we choose, that we see and we will. So those powers, because the soul is perfected by God and elevated to a whole new level, must be perfected. The intellect is perfected by faith. By faith, we are given a knowledge of the truth. And truth is an object, is the object of, of the intellect. That's what the intellect is made for, is to know the truth. And the other power of the soul, the will, is perfected by charity. Now, in charity, the love of God enables us to love what God loves and to love God, the proper object of all Love. The church being a body of men who must agree and cohes- you know, be cohesive and be one, therefore must be made up of men who agree in their minds and who choose the same things. So this is why faith and charity are said by the, the First Vatican Council to be the two bonds of unity of the church. And because the church is visible, because the church is something that we can see, and we must always be able to see the church, then they are visible bonds. So how are they visible? It's not just that our our definition doesn't say that the church is the body of men who are baptised and have the true faith, but it says that they must profess the true faith. They must outwardly profess the true faith because the church must be visible. And it's visible in the fact that we all not only have the faith, but we profess it. And we'll come back to that in a minute. Likewise, subject to the Roman pontiff, it's shorthand for a subject to the laws of the church, the authority of the church. In an interregnum, we are subject to the laws of the church because they're given to us by the Roman pontiff during an interregnum. Normally, we're subject to the laws of the church and... It clearly was subject, therefore, to the, to the Roman pontiff. It's worth pointing out that in the, ch- in the church there are two types of, of authority. A religious understands this, but no, most lay people don't understand this. There is juridical power, we call it jurisdiction, and there is dominative power. Dominative power is the power that, that, that a religious superior has over their subjects, because of the vow of obedience. Jurisdictional power is the power to make laws for people and then to punish infractions of those laws. But if it doesn't sound too light-hearted, the Roman pontiff cannot tell you to go and buy him a Coke. He can only make a law that you shall not drink Coke. Hmm? to which he accepts himself, uh, and then punish infractions of it. As far as I'm aware, the only people he has dominative power over, other than obviously people of his household, are the Jesuits, because they make an additional vow. And we know this is true because they're so obedient. (laughs) So when we say subject to the Roman pontiff, we don't mean subject like a religious is to a religious superior, or, and this is interesting, a father of a family has dominative power over the family. 
I can tell my son to go and get me a Coke, which, of course, I wouldn't do. I'd ask him for a beer. (laughs) And he does have to, he is bound morally to do that if I give him that order. It's very important to have clear ideas on, on that because we can see that the presence, the actual presence of the Roman pontiff in the church is not necessary at all times. It's morally necessary and it's necessary that his laws persist when he's absent. But his actual physical presence at every given time is not required. That's why there can be interania between popes. Because his power isn't a dominative power. He's not having to tell everybody what to do all the time. He's only having to tell us the few things we're not allowed to do and to teach. So the church is that body of men who are baptised and who retain and therefore profess the true faith outwardly and who are once again outwardly subject to the, the authority of the Roman pontiff and who haven't been expelled. Well, nobody's going to get expelled from the church right now. Particularly not for crimes. Crimes are in, not out. Now, if you read a typical theology manual, they will tend to summarise that by saying the church is united in faith, in government, and in worship. Now, in worship, both faith and the union of charity, the union of government, are manifested because we, it's a social act. Even going to confession, the sacrament of penance, is actually a public act, defined as a public act. Well, that's a bit scary really, isn't it? What we do when we worship God is we do something together. And that's very clearly seen in the Holy Eucharist where, as the fathers say, all the grains become one bread and all the grapes become one wine and these are transformed into Christ and, and, and this uniting then unites all of us together in one body, the body of the church. The unity of faith and the unity of charity are generated by the Roman pontiff because he teaches the true faith and he defends the true faith and he establishes good laws and he enforces those laws. And so he is the principle but also the defence of the twin unities of, of the church. And once you even think about that for any time at all, you can see why it's utterly impossible that the men who have set out to destroy the unity of the church in both faith and charity could have been true Roman pontiffs. The notion is incompatible with what that office is. The other great source of unity, uh, I mentioned worship, is the liturgy, the public prayer of the church. And I'm just going to read to you a short passage from uh, a book by one of my favourite authors, a fellow called Father Edward Lean, Father Edward Lean was a Holy Ghost father and a confrere of an Irishman and a confrere of Father Dennis Fahey. So three things in his favour. The life of the church manifests itself uniquely in the love of its divine spouse, Jesus Christ. Every act of the sacred liturgy Every ceremony, every expression is dictated by that love, has its source in it, and is the means by which that love finds voice and utterance. Isn't that beautiful? The soul that is in sympathy with and which enters into this liturgical life gradually assimilates that enthusiastic love of Jesus Christ with which the church palpitates. In this pure and spiritual love, the soul goes outside of itself, relinquishes itself, and espouses the interests of its beloved. It makes its own the interests of Jesus Christ and those of his church, which are identical. 
These interests are simply one absorbing interest, the salvation of the souls of men. This zeal for the expansion of the church, this consuming desire to bring ever-increasing numbers into its fold, becomes the grand passion of the soul that is seized by the spirit of the sacred liturgy. The soul that is possessed by it finds therein the great lever by which it is lifted up above that preoccupation about self, which is the chief obstacle to progress. In this selflessness it will find that quality of simplicity which Jesus so admired in children and which he postulated as the condition of entrance into the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is realised for us here on earth in close and intimate union with God. So that is, in a sense, a complete description of the interior life of the church. And it's another reason why the Novus Ordo cannot be the Catholic Church, because its liturgy is defective, and its liturgy does not produce what we just read about. It produces the opposite. What we just read about is the most intimate union with Christ, and because we're all united with Christ, we're all united with each other. And because we go to this thing we call the liturgy together, we are visibly all united. These are all very obvious things. But sometimes we lose sight of them, and particularly when we're thinking about Where's the unity of the church right now? Well, the unity of the church, which must be visible and must subsist at all times, is seen in exactly what I just described. The traditional Catholics and any remnants of the Novus Ordo, who, if there are people still in there, and and there seems to, they keep appearing, so they must be there to begin with, people who are caught up in the Novus Ordo but do have the true faith, those people and the the traditional Catholics are the Catholic Church today. The Novus Ordo is not only not the Catholic Church as a body, but the members of the Novus Ordo who have ceased to profess the true faith are not members of the Church. They've lost their membership in the Church. And therefore the defect of faith of these individuals doesn't affect the unity in the profession of the one faith of the Catholic Church because they've left the Church by the very fact that they ceased to profess the faith. St. Robert Bellarmine, the great doctor of the Counter-Reformation and very much a providential figure for our time, um, and when I say that, I'll, just, uh, I'll say a few words about Sir Robert Bellarmine. Sir Robert Bellarmine uh, was like the answer desk of the Reformation. Okay, So any Protestant tract that came out that people thought, Phew, this one's pretty curly, they'd post it to him down in Rome. And duly he, he would answer it. And the, at, at the Council of Trent... On the altar they placed the, the, the Holy Scriptures and a copy of the Summa. At the Council of the Vatican in 1870, they didn't place St. Robert's book on the altar, as far as I know, but certainly um, James Broderick, the biographer of, of Bellarmine, says that at Trent, St. Thomas and the Holy Scriptures ruled the debate. At the Vatican Council, St. Thomas the Holy Scriptures and Bellarmine ruled the debate because it was Bellarmine's doctrine that was defined. So Bellarmine is very much a figure of our time as well as the Counter-Reformation. In addition to that, very interestingly, May 13th is his feast day. And so Our Lady chose to appear for the first time at Fatima on the day that would be the feast of St. Robert Bellarmine. And the final piece that should convince us that we ought to be listening to St. Robert Bellman right now is that in 1931 he was declared a doctor of the church. Now he'd been teaching the church for 300 years before that, 400 years virtually. No, 300. And 
Yet in 1931, Providence arranged for him to be brought before us in a new way and with added glory. He is famous for, for many things, uh, but one of the things he's famous for is...